Leonard Skinner will perhaps go down as one of Southern Rock's greatest outfits. Their history is one that was forged by drinking, fighting, long tours, and of course songs and albums that have obtained a legendary status in the music field. With the passing of Gary Rossington just recently, this signalled the last of the original members of this band, and I think they deserve a very special episode to discuss the band's curious history. So let me introduce this special episode dedicated to both Gary Rossington and the Leonard Skinner Band. In 1963, guitarist Alan Collins and singer Ronnie Van Zant would meet each other after their respective bands, The Mods and Us, would play against each other in a battle of the bands during their high school years. Ronnie Van Zant's band, Us, would go on to win this competition, however Alan Collins would leave the band, The Mods, shortly after. In 1964, Ronnie Van Zant would cross paths with bassist Larry Junstrom, drummer Bob Burns, and guitarist Gary Rossington after they would play on rival baseball teams. When Ronnie Van Zant gave Bob Burns an injury during a game of baseball, they would leave the field to go back to Bob Burns' parents' place to start a jam session. After jamming to the Rolling Stones' Time Is On My Side, they immediately decided to form a band. They would approach Alan Collins to join the band as well. There is a story that Collins actually fled from Van Zant on bike and hid in a tree when he saw Ronnie pull into his driveway, but after hearing him out, he decided to join the band as well. The band would go through many name changes, from My Backyard to Conquer the Worm to The Noble Five, until eventually deciding on The 1%. This name stuck for about a year until they decided to change the name again, after being heckled by crowds that their band name meant 1% talent. They would change the name for the very last time to Leonard Skinner. The name was a reference to Alan Sherman's song, Hello Mudder, Hello Fudder. Remember Leonard Skinner, he got ptomaine poisoning last night after dinner. The band's name was also a mocking tribute to a PE teacher at their Robert E. Lee High School who was named Leonard Skinner. Skinner was a strict teacher who enforced a no long hair rule for the boys at their school. Uh, we're talking here with uh, Leonard Skinner, and Leonard, the first thing I need to ask you is, uh, you were their high school uh, gym teacher, is that correct? That's correct. Back in those those years, this was the late 60s, uh, our high school here, the high school here, had uh, a dress code. All teachers and all coaches uh, sent students down if they violated this dress code. Well, <laughs> for, uh, lucky me, <laughs> one of the ones that I sent down was a member of this band, and it was uh, because of his hair length violating the dress code. And uh, he resented it, and uh, so uh, for that reason and the fact that they liked the sound of my name, Leonard Skinner, uh, that, that combination, they, they just proceeded to name the band after me. Despite the band members' disdain for their former PE teacher, they actually invited him to announce the band's performance on stage and on several instances in particular at the Jacksonville Memorial Coliseum. Despite the band members' disdain for their former teacher, despite the band members' disdain for their PE teacher, they actually event. <clears throat> despite the band members' disdain for their former PE teacher, they would actually invite him to various concerts during their history, and on a few rare occurrences, he would actually announce the band before they took their stage. In particular, at the Jacksonville Memorial Coliseum. Yeah, well, kind of we spelled it name. different so he yeah. wouldn't sue us, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think but he that's did, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he opened up a realty company in uh -huh. Florida, Jacksonville, and a couple of nightclubs called Skinner's Place, Yeah, yeah. and uh, we saw him. He introduced the band a couple times on the tribute tour uh -huh. when we started back, saying, I'm the real Leonard Skinner, and I'm going to introduce Leonard Skinner. Leonard Skinner soon became one of the top bands of Jacksonville, touring the local circuits around the 70s. Eventually, in 1972, the band caught the attention of Blood, Sweat and Tears member Al Cooper, who was in attendance to one of their shows. Al enjoyed the band and would actually sign them to the Sounds of the South label, which was distributed through MCA Records, and he even produced their first album. 
Around this time, the band would also round out its members with Billy Powell on keyboards, Ed King on additional guitar, and Leon Wilkerson on bass, bringing the total number of band members to seven. In 1973, the band would release their debut album, called Pronounced Leonard Skinnerd, with their first single being Gimme Three Steps, and the album would go on to be certified two times platinum. The song would tell the tale of a protagonist hitting on a woman at a bar, who unfortunately was taken at the time, and her partner walks in to confront them, gun in hand. This song was based mostly on a real life experience Ronnie had at a bar when he was dancing with another man's woman. This album would also include many live stable tracks, including I Ain't The One, Simple Man, which was covered by the Deftones, and Tuesday's Gone, which was covered by Metallica on their album Garage Inc. Of course, if we are going to talk about pronounced Leonard Skinnerd, we can't miss the track Freebird. A near 10 minute guitar epic which shows the band's three guitar army working in full unison with the rest of the members. This song would be featured in various media such as Guitar Hero and was included in movies such as Forrest Gump, The Devil's Rejects and famously during the church fight in The Kingsman's The Secret Service. In fact, the notoriety of this song would spread further when it was used as a heckle during many other bands' live performances, as can be famously seen on Nirvana's MTV Unplugged. I've been waiting for that. I got a free bird for you right here. In other words, this was the Wonderwall call before Wonderwall was a thing. Except it was more than four power chords, utilizes three guitarists, lasts for double the length, and is actually difficult to play. A great live performance of this song can be found at their 1977 show at Oakland Coliseum Stadium. I will make sure to link this video below in the comment section. This album left a huge resonance in the music field, and it was a tremendous effort by the band. It is often cited as one of the greatest southern rock records ever released. This album would also be featured in Robert Dimery's 1001 albums You Must Hear Before You Die, which I strongly recommend you give a read. The band would follow up with a sophomore effort called Second Helping, released in 1974, which again went two times platinum. While their first album was a tremendous breakthrough for the band, it would be one song on this album that would catapult them into stardom. That song, of course, would be Sweet Home Alabama. This song was instantly catchy and also caught the attention of several artists and music publications. The song's lyrics also took aim at Neil Young, in particular for his song Southern Man from After the Gold Rush. It would lead many to speculate that Leonard Skinner and Neil Young held contempt towards one another. While it could be perceived this way, this was far from the truth and will be covered later on. Sweet Home Alabama was also famously sampled by artist Kid Rock for his track All Summer Long, alongside Warren Zevon's Werewolves of London. It was around this time that the band was at their height of their popularity, and it was also at this time when drummer Bob Burns had a mental breakdown that saw him not only leave the band, but quit music altogether. He would be replaced by drummer Artemis Pyle. The band would have a few lineup changes around this time, but core members Ronnie Van Zant, Gary Rossington, Alan Collins, Billy Powell, and Leon Wilkinson would remain. They also gained additional backup singers Cassie Gaines, sister of the guitarist Steve Gaines, who joined the band on from one from the road. Other singers would include Jojo Billingsley and Leslie Hawkins. 
the band would release the album Nothing Fancy in 1975, which included tracks such as Saturday Night Special and Railroad Song. Gimme Back My Bullets was released the following year in 1976. Ronnie Van Zant almost stopped the pressing of this album as the song Double Trouble, which was written about his life, included the line 11 times been arrested. And around the time it was set to be produced, he would add another notch to his record and wanted to correct the fact. Gary Rossington would also force the band to postpone their tour schedule before they began, as he would drive his Ford Torino into an oak tree while under the influence of drugs and alcohol. The band fined him $5,000 for this incident. This would not be the last of the issues for the tour, as they would also take the title song out of their live set list because when it was played, fans would start to throw bullets and other items on stage. During the same year, they released their first live album, One From The Road, which went three times platinum. The last album they would record together was Street Survivors, which spawned famous tracks like What's Your Name, I Know A Little, You Got That Right, and That Smell. The last of which is perhaps a bit infamous as it talks about Gary Rossington's struggles with alcohol and drugs, in particular the car accident that was mentioned before. As mentioned earlier, many would think that there was a rift between Leonard Skinner and Neil Young. However, this was not true. Ronnie was a huge fan of Neil Young, and in fact can be seen wearing a Neil Young shirt on the Street Survivors album cover, as well as various live footage from around this time. Neil would even send demos to Ronnie Van Zant for his song Powderfinger with intent for them to use the track on their following album. However, before the band could record another record, a tragedy would unfold. A member of the Gillsburg, Mississippi Volunteer Fire Department says when he reached the scene... While many would remember the band for their records and music, most may know of them due to their plane crash. On the 20th of October 1977, three days after the release of Street Survivors, the band would board a plane to travel to Greenville, South Carolina. However, they would never reach their destination. The plane would run out of fuel during the end of their flight and end up attempting a crash landing in a field but missed by some 300 meters, smashing into trees and splitting into pieces. Of the 26 occupants, six would not survive the crash. This included singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Steve Gaines, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, captain Walter McCreary, and first officer William John Gray. Ronnie's wife Judy was on the plane and survived the ordeal. Backup singer Jojo Billingsley was not on the flight as she was suffering from substance abuse and was hospitalized around this time. Jojo reportedly had a dream about a plane crash, even calling Alan Collins to beg him not to get on the plane. Many other occupants were injured during the crash, including keyboard player Billy Powell, whose nose was nearly torn off during the incident. But perhaps the strangest injury to occur was after the flight, when drummer Artemis Pyle went to go get help. He came across a farm steed and was shot when he approached the property. He survived the gunshot and managed to secure aid for the rest of the passengers. In fact, this plane crash served as inspiration in the movie Almost Famous. It is also subtly referenced in Con Air when the prisoners escape. Bunch of idiots dancing on a plane to a song made famous by a band that died in a plane crash. In fact, this accident was possibly avoided by another big band whose crew also inspected the very same plane the day earlier, and found it unfit and not up to the standard they required, so they decided not to use this plane. The band in question was Aerosmith, if you were wondering. Now, define irony. What was perhaps a dark twist of irony was the cover art for the band's last record, Street Fighters, which saw the band on the cover engulfed in flames. The record would be re-released and the album would have the cover donned with a black background out of respect for the tragedy. But because of the accident, the album would reach the highest position of any of their releases at number 6 on the Billboard 200 in 1977, beaten by Fleetwood Mac's Rumours, Linda Stondart's Simple Dreams, Steely Dan's Aha, Commodore's Commodore Lives, and Elvis Presley's Elvis in Concert. 
a tough crowd to contend with. Of course, it should also be noted that Elvis had died two months prior. The original artwork would return on the 30th anniversary of the album's release. With three of their members dead and many others hospitalised, it came to no one's surprise that they dissolved the band shortly after. Gary Rossington would start up a band in 1979 with Alan Collins, who also survived the same plane crash, and call it the Rossington Collins Band. They rounded up the band with former Leonard Skinner members Billy Powell and Leon Wilkinson, also adding singer Dale Krantz, Barry Lee Harwood on guitar, and Derek Hess on drums. During their short tenor, they released two albums called Anytime, Anyplace, Anywhere, and This Is The Way. This is the way. The band would break up, however, in 1982 after arguments, and Gary would go on to do his own thing as the Rossington Band, with Dale returning as the singer. The two also got married around this time. The band released three albums, with Returned to the Scene of the Crime in 1986, Love Your Man in 1988, and Take It on Faith in 2016. Also around this time, Ronnie's brothers Johnny and Donny would form a band. Seriously, say that three times in a row. Donny had been part of the band 38 Special, which had been touring since 74 and released various records over the years. The duo would name themselves Van Zant after their family name, and in 1985 they would release their debut self-titled album. While Rossington's band would be more of a spiritual successor to Leonard Skinner, the Van Zant duo was more in vain to an 80s contemporary rock scene akin to Journey or perhaps Boston. After 10 years of being inactive, excluding reforming for a one-off performance in 1979, the band would eventually get back together in 1987 with Gary Rossington, Billy Powell, Leon Wilkerson and Artemis Pyle, as well as Ed King, to perform a set of concerts for the 10-year anniversary of the crash under Leonard Skinner Tribute Tour. To fill in the role of their lead singer, Ronnie's younger brother Johnny would perform vocal duties. Alan Collins would also join the foray, however, in a limited capacity, requiring former bandmate Randall Hall from the Rossington Collins Band to fill in his role. The year prior, Alan Collins got into a severe car accident while under the influence of alcohol. The accident killed his partner and nearly himself. However, he would survive but would be left paralysed only performing duties as their musical director for the tour. Alan did join the band on stage on most nights, usually addressing the crowd before playing That Smell to tell the crowd about the dangers of drink driving. A lot of the tour's income went towards the Miami Project, which deals with paralysis. This same tour also saw Ronnie Van Zant's widow Judy suing various members of the band for using the band's name. Eventually, a consent order was reached, allowing the band to perform under their name, under several circumstances. This would include when it was appropriate to use the band's name, how tours were allowed to proceed, and how royalties were sorted. Anytime band members wanted to violate their agreement, they would be granted allowances with the permission of all parties involved. It's perhaps interesting to note that Artemis Pyle didn't feel it was necessary to honour this contract and could rip up the agreements made because he added under protest next to his signature on the paperwork. Artemis would try just this when he went to work with Cleopatra Films to make a movie regarding the plane crash as a technical advisor as long as he would receive 5% of the cut to the film. A judge would issue a permanent injunction against the film after he stated the words under protest held no special rights on the contract. A few years later, and the Rebel Rockers would unite for another tour and eventually set about recording new material, with their first album released as a band after 14 years, which would be titled Leonard Skinner 1991. Unfortunately, Alan Collins would not live to see its release as he passed away from pneumonia the year prior. The album spawned a single, Smokestack Lightning, which appeared to do alright in the billboards, especially considering the new world Leonard Skinner was facing. Despite the legal issues, the band would go on to release more albums, with 1993's The Last Rebel, 94's Endangered Species, 97's 20, named after the 20 year anniversary of the plane crash, which saw a lineup change to include one of the original former Leonard Skinner drummers, Ricky Medlock, returned to the band as a guitarist, as well as founding member of the band Outlaws, Huey Thomason, joined the band. 
1999, they would release Edge of Tomorrow and 2000 saw Christmas Time, which of course contained southern rock versions of Christmas themed songs and various covers. The band would have a few lineup changes again during this time, however, original bassist Leon Wilkinson would pass away from natural causes in 2001 after suffering from chronic liver and lung disease. With Leon's passing, it would produce a difficult situation, as one of the agreements for the band's name being used with Judy's permission required at least three original members. The clause would be waived once Donald Ian Evans replaced Leon on the bass guitar. The band would soon release their next album called Vicious Cycle on the 20th of May 2003, nearly 30 years after the recording for their debut album finished, and featured a bonus track in the form of a re-recorded version of Gimme Back My Bullets featuring Kid Rock. The song was also edited with Ronnie's original vocal tracks to give the illusion of a duet between brothers Ronnie and Johnny. A live album was also released during this tour, for which it showed the band celebrating 30 years of rock and roll. Unfortunately, this would be the last studio album featuring Huey Thomason. Leonard Skinner would soon be admitted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2006, which saw Kid Rock induct them into the halls of history. In fact, original drummer Bob Burns would return for a one-off performance with the band during the ceremony to play on Sweet Home Alabama. In 2007, Huey Thomason would suffer a fatal heart attack and pass away. Billy Powell would also suffer a fatal heart attack in January of 2009, but not before completing his parts for Leonard Skinner's upcoming 13th album, God and Guns, which was released in September of that year. The opening track, Still Unbroken, was written about the death of bassist Leon Wilkinson and was used in WWE's pay-per-view event, Breaking Point. The album is a shift in style, focusing on a more rock oriented sound than prior efforts, even featuring Marilyn Manson guitarist John Five on the album. The song Gifted Hands from this album was also a tribute to their fallen band member Billy Powell. The 14th album by Leonard Skinner, and also their last studio album to date, was released in 2012 and is called The Last of a Dying Breed which saw Peter Keys take over keyboard duties. It was revealed after the album was released that Johnny Colt, original bass player for the Black Crows, performed bass duties on this album despite being uncredited at the time. It would also see the return of John Five on guitar duties and also include Johnny's brother Donnie on the song Start Living Again. With the members getting on in their years, it would only seem natural that a number of members would pass away. The first of which was original drummer Bob Burns after suffering a fatal car accident in 2015. Gary Rossington also suffered a heart attack in the same year, which he survived, requiring surgery to fix. Guitarist Ed King would lose his battle with cancer in 2018, and founding bass guitarist Larry Junstrom, who went on to play with the 38 Special from 1974 to 77, would also pass away in 2019. With these deaths, it left Gary Rossington as the last of the pronounced Leonard Skinner era lineup left. In 2017, the members of Leonard Skinner, who survived the plane crash, filed a lawsuit to stop a film that was made about the accident called Street Survivors, The Truth of the Leonard Skinner Plane Crash. This was due to a blood oath the band made after the event to never profiteer from the tragedy and also stems back to their lawsuit that was mentioned prior. The film would proceed, however, being released in 2020 during the Hollywood Real Independent Film Festival. In 2018, Skinner would do their final shows, performing the Farewell Tour, but two shows had to be postponed as Gary once again required heart surgery. The tour would continue until 2020 saw COVID cause widespread cancellations of many shows until they resumed on the 4th of June 2021. Gary Rossington would pass away on the 5th of March 2023. The cause of death has yet to be announced. He was the last of the OG Leonard Skinner crew, and the last of a whiskey rock and roll era. After the news was announced of Gary's passing, many musicians came out to pay their tribute, including drummer Artemis Pyle, Journey's Neil Sean, Metallica's James Hetfield, Megadeth bassist David Ellison, and Kid Rock. Fellow band members and management also announced their grief at the news of Gary's passing. With drummer Artemis Pyle surviving, he remains the last of the Leonard Skinner members who were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
one, he states, is a title that comes with a heavy burden. The status of the band remains unclear with Gary's passing. There were 12 shows left for the farewell tour, and of course, there is much uncertainty about whether or not they will be cancelled. It's too early to tell at this stage, but I feel they might call on someone like John Five or possibly a touring musician to help close out the tour. This is yet to be seen. I personally enjoyed their first album immensely, and I am curious to hear from you about what your favourite album is or experiences seeing the band. And if you have made it this far, I ask one favour from you. As a tribute to Gary, I request that you all listen to Freebird on Spotify or Apple Music and get it back into the charts as a show of appreciation to the band we love. And Gary, may you fly high, you free bird. Thank you all for watching this long episode I initially planned to make as a small tribute video to Gary, and this was actually followed up with a limited history of the band, but after researching more and more events surrounding them, it turned into this hugely long episode. Thank you again for watching until the very end, and if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, and consider subscribing to our channel as well. Also be sure to check out our channel for other music related material, such as the 5 minute reviews on new albums, retro reviews on older albums, our game that we play called Live Listen Erased, which is the equivalent of Marry, Screw, Kill in the music world, reaction videos, and live streams that we do every Friday. I hope you have a great day and stay spicy.